Hi, my name is Dr. S.M. Rodriguez. I am the director of the LGBTQ studies program at Hofstra University. On April 23rd, uh, 2020, Hofstra University hosted its seventh LGBTQ studies symposium. However, for the first time, it was virtual. Co-sponsored by the Department of Sociology and Criminology Program, the Center for Race, Culture, and Social Justice, Student Access Services, and the Hofstra Cultural Center, we heard 10 scholars, activists, and artists respond to the question posed by the symposium title, Deviant Past, Subversive Futures. The three panels were recorded and are offered here. Panel one was titled, Queer Artistry, Performance, and Subjectivity. Panel two, Decarcerating Disability, Abolishing Gender, and Decolonizing Our Future. Panel three, Re-Envisioning Care, Nurture, and Hope for a Queer Future. So first we'll have Elise Armani, who um, is speaking on the possibility of a queer echo, Sharon Hayes, and the reenactment of queer subjectivities. Um, so Elise Armani uh, uses she, her pronouns for your note, and is a New York-based independent curator, writer, and art historian. She has contributed to curatorial projects at the Solomon R. Guggenheim Museum, the Dallas Museum of Art, the Walker Art Center, and the Wiseman Art Museum. Her recent exhibitions include Body Ego, Making Room, and Cultivating the Garden. And she's currently teaching and working toward her PhD in the Department of Art History and Criticism at Stony Brook University. Our second speaker, Alan Pelayas Lopez, is actually going to, um, just small note to the program, the title is Fugitive Poetics as Trans-Oceanic Queer Practice, uh, Praxis. Um, Alan is an Afro-Indigenous poet, installation and adornment artist from Oaxaca, Oaxaca, Mexico. They are the author of Intergalactic Travels, Poems from a Fugitive Alien, uh, which came out this year, and To Love and Mourn in the Age of Displacement, which also came out this year. Uh, <laughs> their poetry has been nominated for the Pushcart Prize and Best of the Net, and selected to appear in Best New Poets 2019, and Best uh, American Experimental Writing 2020. Alan's work is published um, and or forthcoming in Poetry Magazine, The Georgia Review, Puerto del Sol, uh, Everyday Feminism, Rewire News, Splinter News, and elsewhere. Uh, they have received fellowships and or residencies from Submittable, the Museum of, uh, of the African Diaspora, and other places, and they currently live in Oakland, California. Third up will be Athena Bell Fairplay, who is an author and an artist who will be reading from her new novel, Nephilobata, that came out last year. She is a uh, Brooklyn-based, London-bred artist, spiritualist, and storyteller. Her first novel, Nephilobata, is a contemporary coming-of-age tale about magic, fierce love, complex family relationships, and embracing one's power. Athena also runs the Life as Art Show, which is a YouTube channel exploring esoteric spirituality. Our final panelist is Kyria Traber, um, who is a playwright and cultural worker based in New York City, um, who will be speaking on uh, If This Be Sin, Gladys Bentley and Riotous Queer Resistance in the 1930s. Um, Oh, there was an uh, there was an addition to the <laughs> to that with that um, nineteen through the nineteen fifties um, in New York. So Kiria Traber um, is a nationally awarded playwright, actress, and cultural worker. She is the lead community artist in residence with the Lincoln Center of Education. Um, her latest work, If This Be Sin, is a musical about the gender bending Harlem Renaissance performer Gladys Bentley. Um, and Kiria is a co-host of uh, a podcast called Cheers and Queers. Um, 
and was also a co-host of the PBS series, per, uh, First Person, from 2017 through 2019. And so I thank you all for coming. Uh, panelists, I, I really appreciate and I'm looking forward to hearing uh, uh, all that you have to share. So Elise, uh, if you can start us out. Sure, thank you so much. And let me just start by saying um, it's such an honor to be in this uh, amazing company and I am really looking forward to what everyone else is presenting today. Um, and I also want to just apologize in advance. Uh, one of the challenges of working from home has been uh, working with my two dogs. And so if they make auditory uh, appearances throughout the presentation, um, my apologies. <laughs> so I'm just going to share um, some slides. Okay, great. So um, as Essam mentioned, I'm going to be speaking about uh, Sharon Hayes, who's a performance artist, and uh, what I have theorized as um, the possibility of, of locating a queer echo in her work as a, a new way um, of formulating the um, spatiality of sort of history as it perpetuates. And so um, I'll begin by just introducing her work a bit and then sort of move into this theory. So queer multimedia artist Sharon Hayes uses this term respeaking to describe her performance practice of reciting the words of historical figures as transmediated through cultural records. Respeaking is a procedure by which embodied speech propels a text beyond its material repository and formative context into a new and unexpected site. Drawing texts from specifically homosocial or gender defiant histories, Hayes' respeaking serves to open up queer potentialities into sites of further speculation. Building on Adriana Cabrero's theorization of subject formation through a maternal echo, in this presentation, I will analyze two of Hayes' performances in order to posit the queer echo as a model for the formation of a historically grounded queer subject. The relation I draw between queer history and the subject formation and subject formation and the phenomenon of the echo is based in two ontological specificities of the echo. This first specificity I wanna draw your attention to is the loosening of sound, which occurs in the resonances of the echo, which I theorize as a potentiality for rereading and speculative understanding. And the second specificity is the nature of the echo as a relational bridge, which is both nonlinear and polydirectional, which I theorize can serve as an alternative model to the hegemonic institution of history as based in straight time. So in Ovid's Metamorphosis, Echo um, is this talkative mountain nymph who is stripped of her ability to vocalize by Juno and condemned to only repeat the sounds of others, uh, reflecting and refra refracting their words. And as the story goes, Echo falls in love, encounters and falls in love with Narcissus, who, destined to love only his own image, rejects her embrace after an adroit dialogue in which Narcissus speaks and his words uh, merely boomerang back to him. Distressed by her rejection and her inability to vocalize her words, uh, Echo fades away um, until only her mimetic voice remains. Thus, Echo becomes Echo as we know her, uh, repeating the words of others, her subjectivity defined in the, by the vocalizations that both precede and follow her. So in her 2005 text, uh, For More Than One Voice, Adriana Cabrero takes up this narrative um, by Ovid of Echo as an account of subjective dissolution through the reduction to resonance, which Cabrero reads as a caution of dangers inherent in imbalances in acoustical agency. Cabrero emphasizes the relational nature of the vocal sphere, which is demonstrated aptly in this myth of Echo and Narcissus, um, and its susceptibility in particular to dynamics of power. So questions of whose voice is heard, whose voice is repeated and thus perpetuated. Um, so vocal emissions in this sense are relational in that they broadcast themselves outside of the speaker in order to be received through the audiological cap capabilities of another subject. Uh, but they're also relational in the sense that the significance or meaning of a vocalization is formulated through and registered against former and future expressions that come from a plurality of voices. Demonstrating this relational nature of vocality and its central role in the formation of subject, Cabrero uh, turns to the contingent vocalizations between mother and infant in which a reversal of Echo's loss of subjectivity occurs. So through the developmental maternal relation, the unique and individual subject of the child is discovered and formulated through rather than in spite of the mimetic echoes that form this relational bridge. 
As Cabrero demonstrates, here echo comes to represent not a loss of subjectivity, but a formulation of subjectivity through the acoustic re relationality in which one distinguishes and locates their own voice. Yet it's important to recognize the power inherent in this relationship, and also that there are limitations to the formation of subjectivity as based in immediate familial relations. Given Cabrera's theory of relational locality, how can we account for the queer subject? They who emerge not through, but rather in spite of nuclear family-based identity formation. So looking to the ontological qualities of the echo, and I apologize for my um, very uh, basic di uh, <laughs> diagram of the echo, um, we can understand that the echo is uh, mimetic. Um, but though it is mimetic, uh, the fidelity of the translocated sounds loosens and distorts with each resonance. And while we understand the echo as a lingering demarcation of the presence of sound, it's important to note that the echo is fluid, temporal, and it evades discrete forms. So through this spatiotemporal bouncing, the sound departs from the specificities of its emergence, and it's transported into these new contexts and significances. So unlike a photograph, which functions as an index of something that's decidedly in the past, the echo, in order to be heard, is the attendance of a sound that must be present. And as such, the echo functions as this relational bridge between the source and moment of the sound's emergence and the location and moment of the sound's reception. So this double directional and nonlinear um, way that the echo bounces, um, it's bouncing off each surface it encounters um, with each resonance sort of batting the initial reverberance further into the future and shifting its direction until the echo um, has fully sort of redistributed its energy. And so in the existence um, outside of and in spite of institutional and compulsory heterosexual histories, um, it's my conjecture that queer histories exemplify this nonlinear and relational and contingent role of the echo in relying on oral historical traditions, desire, personal archives, and speculative revisiting. And thus, I'd like to pose this possibility of a queer function in the echo. So I will argue here that we can think of Sharon Hayes's practice of respeaking historical documents as embodying this queer echo, in which the existence of queerness in both the past and the future hinges on the remediation or echo of history through the queer subject. <clears throat> so the enactment of queer subjectivity and breaking from the orientation of compulsory heterosexuality is, uh, as Sarah Ahmed describes, a stepping out of line or reorientation away from a prescribed direction. And this formation of this new space offline occurs through proximity to queerness, as well as through the performance of repetitive labor. So without the auto presence of a given lineage, uh, queerness as becoming is an act um, that requires labor of both turning to search for queer presence in the past, as well as creating space for queerness in the future. Uh, offline and outside of institutional histories and traditions, this existence of queerness is evidenced and continued in the form of an echo. So in Sharon Hayes's practice of respeaking, the echo is both source and effect. As she revocalizes speeches, chants, and declarations of the past, she illustrates the formative role of singular moments of time in giving form to the future, drawing from the documentation of specific histories and creating further documents of those histories. Hayes demonstrates this shifting morphology of subjectivity and meaning that occurs through the retelling and reencountering of the past. The resulting cessations in linear time serve as moments of potentiality in which an intervention into the formation of individual as well as collective subjectivities can occur. So as we can recognize within Hayes' work and likely within our own research and experience, the existence of queerness in both the past and future often hinges on these moments of, of remediation of history through our own queer subjectivities. So Hayes positions her body as echo, the medium through which these transmissions of meaning can occur and evolve, and, and doing so demonstrates how these transmissions produce public knowledge and contribute to the formation of collective and individual subjectivities. So the interpreter project that we're looking at here from 2001 is Hayes' first video work in which the artist visited the historic homes of four prominent American women as preserved by the National Park Service. So during her visits to the homes of Clara Barton, Maggie Walker, Mary McLeod Bethune, and Eleanor Roosevelt, Hayes took several guided tours by historic interpreters that are employed by the National Park Service and recorded these varying individual interpretations of each of the guides at each site. 
And following her visit, she edited these tours into single composite tours of each home, which uh, amalgamated the various interpreters' words into one narrative, while simultaneously omitting the comments and questions of the visitors. Hayes then recorded herself reading off these new tour scripts. And in the videos that comprise this four channel um, interpreter project, Hayes stands listening to the audio of her own voice through these headphones and re-speaks these hybrid tours aloud in front of the camera, which closely crops her face. Each script, which is roughly 15 minutes long, is repeated four times. And it's significant to note, rather than standing in front of the subject's historical homes, Hayes's videos are set in front of random homes in Los Angeles, completely divorced from the context of this text that she's re-speaking. <clears throat> so Hayes describes these tours given by the historic interpreters as negotiating between individual experiences of history and official narratives or collective experience as dictated by institutions and authorities such as the National Park Service. Each interpreter retells the same story, and yet their retelling is marked by differences in language, intonation, and emphasis. But through the officiality of the National Park Service, the wholeness of the narrative maintains intact in order to project this false assertion that no matter who tells a story, the conclusions are the same. In this work, Hayes raises the question of how knowledge is institutionally produced and validated, as well as how that information shifts through its repetition by individual subjects. So in addition to negotiating the, or to highlighting this negotiation between personal and collective perspectives, um, the work also begs the question of, of what is omitted when the complexity of a life is reduced to a 15 minute script. What is foregrounded as important and what is negated as extraneous. And this becomes really evident in the case of Eleanor Roosevelt. Um, Hayes highlights that um, this, her significance is asserted through her relationship to her husband, of course. Um, and there's simultaneously a lack of acknowledgement and erasure of her queer relationship with Lorena Hickok. And Hayes actually observed on one of her, the tours she attended as um, an interpreter was asked by another visitor about Hickok and cites the response of the interpreter who stated, I don't know, we weren't there. That's just my own personal interpretation. We all interpret differently and you have to be careful with what you read because not all books say the same thing. So this interpreter's response foregrounds the act of interpretation as responsible for the determination of what information is included and perpetuated and what information is occluded and ultimately erased. And in doing so highlights this heterosexually compulsive nature or straightening device of history. While the failure to acknowledge Roosevelt's queer orientation is seen as interpretation, the failure to acknowledge her heterosexual her heterosexual relation to FDR would undoubtedly be seen as an irresponsible omission of fact. When Hayes respeaks this interpreter's erasure of Roosevelt's queerness, it creates a moment of disjunction for audience members who are familiar with the artist, as the interpretation and personal spin she vocalizes is clearly not her own. These disjunctures between the words spoken and who is speaking them, as well as between the location of the subject and the location in which the words are being spoken, are key to the function of this work as a queer echo. In these breaks in believability, the perceived objective and representational nature of, his, of the historic institution is faltered, and the role of interpretation, or rather misinterpretation of a singular experience through the lens of multiple subjectivities becomes clear. In these moments where repetition fails to convince or construct a believable narrative, potential arises in which the viewer may consider and question the infelicity between voice and experience. The temporal collapsing that occurs within Hayes's gesture of respeaking can be understood through the lens of queer temporality as acting against the auto-naturalizing temporality of straight time. Straight time, as theorized by Jose Esteban Munoz, as well as Elizabeth Freeman, emphasizes the here and now over the past and future, while simultaneously projecting a colonized narrative of the future is only possible through and available for a reproductive heterosexual majority. In Queerness's Horizon, Munoz posits queerness as stepping out of the linearity of straight time and questioning straight time's presentness. Munoz speaks as a utopic, temp a utopic queer temporality, specifically in relation to performativity and this utopic gesture of doing in futurity, or locating queer relation in all formations simultaneously within the future as well as within the past. So in this other work from 2003, Symbione's Liberation Army, um, Screed's number 13, 16, 20, and 29, 
Hayes respeaks the infamous words of media heiress Patty Hearst, who was kidnapped in 1974 by the Symbionese Liberation Army. So led by Donald DeFries, who was an incarcerated black man who escaped from prison in California and composed predominantly of white University of California Berkeley students, the SLA was a self-described federated union of military political elements of many different liberation struggles. And so Hearst, a white 19-year-old Californian, is kidnapped and held for ransom of $400 million from the Hearst fortune with the demands that this ransom be distributed to feed the welfare recipients of California. During Hearst's captivity, she infamously communicated to her family, to the FBI, and the greater public through a series of communiques that were mailed to the Berkeley radio station, KPFA, with instructions for them to be broadcast publicly. Using the notoriety of her kidnapping as a microphone, the SLA vocalized their demands through the communiques, growing from a, localized, a local organization to dominating national media in doing so. Over the six months and four communiques, perception of who Hearst was and what she represented changed radically at both the level of her family as well as the level of the nation as a public. From the first tape to the fourth tape, her communications to the public transitioned from instructions seemingly recited by an innocent victim at the hands of her captors to declarations of revolution seemingly vocalized by an active participant in the cause. To create this particular work, Hayes memorized the words of each of the four communiques and recited them in front of a live audience. The audience, equipped with printed transcripts of the communiques, was instructed to correct her when she misstated or strayed from her words. And I just want to show a quick 10 second clip of one of these videos. Okay. And just do it quickly. The SLA. I've been stopping and starting this tape myself so that I can collect my thoughts. That's why there are so many stops. Um, I'm not being forced to say any of this. I think it's really, I think it's really important that. So what you can hear um, in this clip is this audience off scene um, who, you know, it begins in the beginning of the videos as these timid voices that offer up sort of one correct word at a time. And as the uh, tapes progress, um, it, the audience members grow more confident in their role as um, monitors of the narrative and the voices grow louder with multiple people chiming in at once um, as humor is found in her inability to sort of correctly remember the lines. And the irony of this last statement, that she's not being forced to say this, is of course not lost on the audience. Um, the live audience, in not forcing Hayes as Hearst to speak, is positioned in this work as the SLA. And we, as the, as the viewers, attempting to make a sense of the significance of Hayes' words, um, and the voice in the video, are positioned as the public. Several parallels beyond the scripts exist between Hayes' work and the original communiques. Hearst served as a strategic voice in the projection of the SLA's narrative due to her family's economic and cultural capital. The SLA relied on her notoriety to elevate their communiques in the same way that Hayes is playing on the international infamy of the kidnapping in the creation of this work. Both Hayes and the SLA's recordings are marked by a performative dependence on both previous as well as forthcoming media, as both address a public mediated through technological repetition of voice and image. In Communique 28, Hearst infamously comes out as Tanya, pledging her allegiance to the SLA and shedding her patrilinear name, Patty, for a new chosen name. She begins the tape with a statement of authenticity, emphasizing again that her words are, agent are agentic and individual and are not being forced by the SLA. The statement, met by many, of the public, mem many members of the public with disbelief, is one moment in a continual reframing of the words accompanying Hearst's voice on the communiques. Words which have been circulated, mediated, and interpreted continuously during her kidnapping, as well as in the decades since, through infinite lenses. Hayes' addition to this echoing of Hearst's voice through time and space serves as a critical intervention into the shaping of Hearst's narrative. In substituting her own body for Hearst's, Hayes not only highlights the unanswerable question of Hearst's possible agency, 
in creating the communiques, but also highlights the invisibility of her politicized body within the tapes. Um, the original tapes are just auditory. As a young, white, wealthy, educated woman, Hearst's kidnapping, originally misattributed to two Black men, served as a proxy for broader American anxieties and ideals around purity, white supremacy, heterosexuality, matrimony, and class. The narrative of the media, despite SLA's composition of primarily white actors, many with backgrounds not dissimilar from Hearst's, positioned Hearst as the damsel in distress captured by a radical, racialized group of militants. America rallied around Hearst, not only as a daughter lost by her family, but as a daughter lost by her country. And the SLA represented not only a threat to American security, but also to American status quo. The contentious and subsequent humor of Hearst's character following her transition to a radical member of the SLA and culminating in her participation in a California bank robbery stems from Hearst's failure or infidelity to the heterosexual narrative she was prescribed. Her disorientation from the path delineated from her was pathologized and criminalized as a failed alignment of embodiment voiced in both legal and medical discourses. In Hayes's removal of her body and the imposition of her own body into this narrative, also as a white woman, but marked by a butch sensibility that is decisively unprotected by American heteropatriarchy, Hayes reveals the optics of the creation and narration of her subjectivity. Standing in for Hearst as a simultaneously invisible and hypervisible figure, Hayes raises questions of agency and authenticity in the formation of subjectivity for both Hearst and herself. In the moments of forgetting in this piece, like the moments of disjuncture in the interpreter project in which these questions are located. Sorry, it is the moments of forgetting in this piece, like the moments of disjuncture in the interpreter project in which these questions are located. During the awkward pauses and uncomfortable interruptions of linearity that ensue, the relationality between voice, embodiment, audience, and the echo are made explicit. The use of sound in Hayes' work is critical to the work's interest in the intersections between temporality, subjectivity, narrative, and historical embodiment. As demonstrated in the myth of echo and narcissus, the existence of sound across time is unique and relational. So, uh, further, sound is a formless and perpetually becoming matter. Sound cannot be experienced unless it exists in the presence. As such, it always occurs as a collapsing temporality. Thus, the queer echo is not a representation of a historical moment in time, but rather a bridging of that moment into the present and a perpetuating of that moment into the future. Thank you. Thank you so much, Elise. Um, that was fantastic. Alon, uh, we'll just do a a steady kind of transition into next speaker. Um, I do want to remind, well, actually, I do want to notify everyone that when you have questions, uh, you are more than welcome to use the Q and A function that you'll see at the bottom of your screen. Um, if you type in your question there, I'll be able to ask um, the panelists your questions when we have our uh, Q and A section, uh, which is reserved for the last 20 minutes, okay? Thank you so much, um, Elise and Sam, for this. I really appreciate the space. Um, my name is Alan, and I'm going to be reading from my two manuscripts. Uh, my talk today is titled Fugitive Poetics um, as Transoceanic Queer Praxis. And what I mean by that is uh, when I think about transoceanic, I think about uh, transpacific, transatlantic, and transnational experiences of Blackness, indigeneity, um, and queerness. Um, my work is really invested um, in, no sh in understanding what it means to uh, live as a fugitive subject and to always be assembling um, existence, particularly through the lens of the law, um, in that I was undocumented for 17 years and uh, legal violence was kind of at the forefront of my every day. Um, and at one moment, I thought that me being undocumented was um, the biggest um, thing in my life, but it wasn't. It was actually living in a body that is red as femme, that is red as black, that is red um, uh, sometimes as trans or um, non gender non-conforming. So I'm going to be reading a few poems and then uh, I'll give some brief uh, comments after the poems. And I do have, I'm a multimedia artist, so I have visuals. <laughs> Just gonna show them one sec. 
Oh, how do I share? Alon, if you see at the bottom of the screen in the center, there's um, a green mm. button. Got it. Thank you. Okay. So I crossed the US-Mexico border when I was five years old and I went to photograph it um, when I was still undocumented. And this is a photograph. I only was, it, was only able to capture two photographs before um, an immigration agent uh, rang an alarm and drove to me and removed me from the border. But I'll open up with this poem called Sick in America. Before the crossing, our family could understand the whispers of the water. We bathed our cuerpos morenos as if we were holy, as if our humanity was valuable, as if we were worth life. It is hard to remember anything before the crossing. How do I tell myself I had a childhood if at the age of five I am a fugitive of the law? It would be easier to remember life before the crossing if we didn't become paralyzed for the rest of our lives. The doctor tells me I have post-traumatic stress disorder. He says it is because I am an immigrant, but that in a few years I will be American. During the crossing, we were faced with the reality of what it means to be Black and Indian in an empire that constantly measures us on production, production, and production. Our blood, a sustenance for those who deem us illegal. The water here has been cut through by wooden logs that demand we show them papers that say we are not poor, nor Indian, or Black. I only crossed once. Location, San Diego-Tijuana border. Age, five. How? By foot and car. But every story heard becomes another crossing. My body remembers every crossing. Every crossing becomes mine. My body has experienced every crossing in dreams. Fugitive, runaway slave, fugitive, runaway Indian, fugitive, runaway soon to be lynched Negro, fugitive, Asata Shakur, fugitive, Mike Brown, fugitive, Sandra Bland, crossing, the precise location in a five-year-old's life where they lose their humanity, health, and livelihood. The site where the child realizes her guiding spirit is weakening, the body changing, the mind confused, flesh shivering, eyes watering, digits dancing. The site where Americans will blame the child for infecting the American dream. The site where a child is just a child visiting occupied Indian land. Quote, the black body that does not migrate, it is shipped, end quote. American, I guess I'll be forever sick. Um, and this next poem is titled Blackness Embodied Treats the News. In under two months, two young boys of color have died, and I don't know what to do anymore. Joaquin Luna Jr. was 18 when he died. The New York Times says he committed suicide because he was undocumented. Joaquin left a letter detailing the struggles of undocumentedness. This wasn't suicide though. This empire killed him. This empire is killing all of us. I mean, we are here. Everyone knows we are here, but the law names us illegal. Technically, we have no rights or legal protection, but at any moment, the law can discipline us punish us. This is to say the law decides when it wants to author us into existence. Often I find myself asking, is there a life after fugitivity or is fugitivity a way of life? These have been the hardest days of my life lately. Two months and a week after Joaquin's death, Trayvon Martin was killed. Trayvon was a 17-year-old black boy. In a My Fox Orlando interview, his father tells the camera that Trayvon was just visiting him from Miami. Even for those who can legally travel, their travels are met with sequestration and death. But ain't that the story of blackness in the Americas? And shouldn't we refuse this story? No longer tolerate it. When Joaquin Luna Jr. died, I was furious and scared. 
scared that none of us know how to hold each other because we are too busy avoiding our deportations and deaths. When Trayvon Martin was killed, I felt part of my spirit leave my body and it hasn't returned since. I am tired of reading the news. I am tired of concerned citizens taking action post-death. I'd like all of us to live, please. I want Joaquin Luna Jr. back. I want Trayvon Martin back. I want the world to love us and hold us. It's happened again and again and again. I've lost track of how many Black folk have died. I kept saving their photos on my desktop. Too many photos on my desktop that I kept messing up their names. Couldn't put a name to a face anymore. A few looked like me. Most were darker than me. A lot were younger than me. A lot of girls, actually. I'm scared. I am becoming obsessed with documenting their photographs. They are forgotten so quickly. One of the latest is Nia Wilson. She was an 18-year-old Black girl. In an online elegy, her future is spelled out. She was to own a dance studio. Days after her death, a friend reminds me that though this violence can happen to us at any moment, this violence isn't happening to us right now. And so we hold one another, whispering into each other's ears, I love you. I love you. I love our people. I keep thinking of Trayvon Martin and Neil Wilson's deaths. I don't know what it is that I'm fighting for at this moment. I used to think that my biggest problem was being undocumented. It is not. I am learning to be Black and queer in the United States, and it is hard. Mama reminds me that it is also as hard back home because there we're not just Black, but we're the Black Indians who survived. And still, Ama assures me that the problem isn't Blackness or Indianness. The problem is the settler's world, particularly settler rage, settler fear, and settler citizenship. I want Joaquin Luna Jr. back. I want Trayvon Martin back. I want Nia Wilson back. I want the world to love us and hold us. Um, and then these other poems are written inside immigration forums and I'll just read directly from the forums. Um, I won't read the whole instructions. Um, maybe I'll just read, uh, yeah. Deborah Miranda says that surviving comes in the retelling. But what does it mean to survive Zapotec and mystic genocide, slavery and illegality? How does one quantify the trauma of settler colonialism? At the East Boston Community Health Clinic, Dr. H laughs at me when I ask if there is a test for post-traumatic slave syndrome. She looks at me. Imbecile, I read in her eyes, nose, throats, and cheeks. I want to say that the harm, mistreatment, and threat is always there. At the corner store, on the bus, at the Y, in my front door, at UC Berkeley, at the airport, at the post office. I want to say that the harm is caused by the settler and the visitor. I am tired of answering these questions, sir. Will I live, sir? Do you promise I won't die at the corner store, sir? On the bus, at the Y, in my front door? I am scared, sir. Do I pass your test, sir? Yes, I am sure I am a fag, a, an Indian. The fear of torture is not particular to my body. It is, it is not particular to my country. It is particular to my body. I live in an ungovernable body. Christina Sharp asks, how does one memorialize the everyday when living in a body like mine? Do you get what I'm saying, sir? I have already been subjected to torture, sir. Look at my medical records. Look at my tuberculosis treatment. Go find my sister's cadaver and look for the cause of death. Read my poems, sir. Read our poems, sir. Poems are evidence, sir. This is the evidence, sir. Read poems. 
I met a boy when I was 19. He had a scar below his left nipple. When I asked him how he got it, he covered it with his digits and said, when I crossed. That's when I told him I loved him. Loved him for crossing, loved him for living, loved him for sharing, loved him for trusting. Loved him for reminding me we are human. Loved him for honesty, loved him for stories, loved him for poetry. I met a boy when I was 19. He had spent two years, 17 days in a detention center. I swore to set the border on fire. I met a boy when I was 19 and we did immoral things. We are criminals, sir. Take me, 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 take me. Me. And I'll end with this very brief piece. Um, illegal is to poet when the government demands and needs your silence. And illegal is to have survived again and again and still be running. And illegal is to find pleasure on the lips of another alien and finally call that living. Thank you. Oh, deep breath. <laughs> Um, thank you, Alon. Continuing to collect questions, um, and we have a couple so far. Like I said, I'm going to hold them until all speakers have a chance. Um, but please, please, as they come to you, go ahead and type them into the Q&A box, which you can locate at the bottom of your screen. Um, all right, thank you. Uh, next, we'll hear from Athena Bell Fairplay, who will be reading from Nefilavata. Hi everyone, thank you. Um, I'll be reading from my book, Nephilabata. I thought I would uh, start with the title of this novel, actually. As a true um, millennial, I discovered it while scrolling through Tumblr um, a few years back. It was a blog that was run by a um, creative writing, somebody getting their masters in creative writing and English literature. And her whole blog was a compilation of arcane beautiful words from different um, cultures and languages around the world and Nephilabata really struck me it's an ancient Greek word which means cloud walker or someone who walks in the clouds of their imagination a daydreamer and this was such a striking word to me I immediately had this download of the story that the Nephilabata were this noble society of very poised, magical people who dwelled in the clouds. Um, it was melodious, it had meaning that really struck me. The uh, protagonist of the story is called Nephilia, and she's one of the Nephilabata. She's next in line to lead her people, but she kind of feels crushed by destiny, this destiny and uh, duty. So she finds herself, the book opens up with Nephilia spinning from the clouds and falling to earth in this uh, and landing in this unnamed West African town where she meets her lover to be Amma. And I'm going to read from chapter four where uh, Nephilia is explaining to Amma where she comes from and about um, this culture that she derives from. My mother caught my father making love to the sea. Making love in the sea, Nephilia corrected. No, he would sneak out most nights and come down to the sea. The other women would gossip and tease mother, telling her that he was cheating with one of the fishermen's wives while her husband was away at sea. God knows how they knew my father left home, but they did, small town. They gossiped about how my mother could be so pretty and adoring of him, 
and yet he was out sneaking out almost every night to have affairs. So she followed him one night, expecting to find him with that other woman. He took off all of his clothes, and she watched as he morphed into sand. At first she was relieved he was having an affair. She, he wasn't having an affair, but she grew weary of the times he didn't come home until first light. Ah, he is a sandman. Yes, mother knew from that day that she would never have him fully. How can you compete with something as wildly beautiful as the sea, Nephilia replied. Anna was amused that even supernatural Nephilia was not immune to the childish play of the seaside. She buried her slim feet in the sand and was using her hand to build domes around them. Let's get in, said Anna, but I cannot swim. We can go in up to our necks. Nephilia kept her clothes on, not wanting to expose her body in sunlight and make a spectacle of herself. Amma took off her shirt and kept on the long tunic that covered her to mid-thigh. Tell me, Nephilia, what did you stop believing that made you fall? The Nephilabata are cloud people. We are millennia old. Some of us are muses. We work with humans to bring great works into the world. Some of us can bond to humans while you are in the dream state, assisting you in receiving special messages and making inventive connections you'd never think up in your waking hours. There are those that live on only air, sunlight and chi for weeks at a time. They spend hours meditating and emerge with enlightened texts to share with the people. That sounds deliriously beautiful, said Amma wistfully. Nephilia shook her head and continued, most have lost their minds. They spend hours in a trance state recounting words that are so complex, so no one, not even the smartest Nephilabata, Queen Nefiri, can translate them to our people, yet alone the humans. Yet out of respect, we sit for hours in assemblies, listening to them talk incessantly. I stopped believing in our ways of life. I question if how we are living has value. Why did you fall? My people have become haughty and disconnected from the world. They are disdainful of humans. They think you are too stupid and self-involved, beyond help and inspiration. The Nephilabata criticize human greed, yet they are happy to swan around in beautiful cloth, spouting complex esoteric nonsense, with no aim of making it useful or relatable, which is our dharma, our purpose. I think we have become prideful, useless, what does it mean to be one of the 11, asked Amma. At birth, you are assigned a number that speaks to the shape of your soul and your dharma. The 11s are the ones imbued with spiritual clarity and blessed intuition. From birth, everyone treats you like you're special, as if every word you utter is going to be profound and poetic. Nephilia shook her head. The Nephilabata's melancholy made her layered voice even more beautiful as if she were singing one of the gloomy split spirituals Amma's mother liked to hum. Oh, we have a system like that on earth. I am a three. I am supposed to have a gift for words. The seer said, I'm here to inspire with language. But for the most part, I feel like an illiterate lump, Amma laughed awkwardly. The two bell women looked at each other and then out to the horizon, feeling small. They decided to dry off under the last vestiges of sunlight. What are you going to do to get back to your people? asked Amma. I don't know if I want to get back, Nephilia hesitated. At least, just not just yet. I want to stay here with you and Mama, eating soup and playing in the sand. She used her foot to collapse the sandcastle she'd been building. I think I am here to learn something. I'm not the first Nephilabata to lose her sense of hope and inspiration, but I am the first to fall. It was getting late. The girls decided to go back through the market to buy the rice, vegetables and coconut milk that Mama had requested. They turned down a narrow alleyway that led to the square. Amma heard the familiar rattle of the blind shaman's tin pot. He was leaning in a doorway with his ear cocked in their direction. He beckoned them over with veiny, crooked fingers. Amma wrapped an arm around Nephilia's waist as they made their way towards him. You are an eleven, hmm, blessed with foresight, tasked with connecting generations, genders, and cultures. You have great ability, a fine sense of creativity. 
Nathalia listened patiently to words she'd heard many times before. Emma grinned, proud to have such a noble playmate. She reached into her purse to fetch a piece of silver. The coin landed in the old man's pot and clanged loudly against the others. The girls turned to walk towards the market, but the shaman continued. You were meant to be a prophetess, but you are a dreamer. He got louder now, using his stick to straighten up as much as his rickety old spine would allow. It was like watching an ancient tree grow right in front of your eyes. He looked up into Nephilim's face with eyes that were glazed over in a cloudy sky blue that reminded her of home. You are too busy sitting, pondering and pontificating, he spat. He shrank back down, allowing his spine to contort back to its decrepit frame. With a shrug, he added, you will fail. Nephilim's eyes turned a deep blackened purple. Amma noticed the Nephilabata was holding her breath. Nephilia went to speak, but instead replaced the sunglasses on her nose and pursed her lips, her jaw clenched around unspoken words. Amma pulled Nephilia in towards her and led her back towards the market square. He's a stupid old man. The other day he gave me a reading. It went as deep as, pay attention to the signs. Amma raised her hands to the sky and giggled. But that reading was deep. He knew I was an eleven. He said things that sounded like the oracle back home, and he said I would fail. I thought I was better than them, different from those frumpy elders, but it seems I was wrong. You cannot give up, Nephilim. You and your people have been charged with safekeeping human dreams and inspiration. Look at our town. Emma gestured to the market square. Young, pretty girls wearing brightly coloured jeans and rouge lips flirted with middle-aged middle men. Beer bottles were piled up in mountains in the gutter, and a few elders were scavenging in bins. Mother said she never saw a person beg in this village until two years ago. We should be thriving with the discovery of gold. Instead, we are getting lost in greed. We are poorer than ever. No one is creating or inventing. No one is writing and painting. If they pray, it is for gold, not grace. Is that our fault? My fault? asked Nephilia. No, but we need your help, Emma's voice quivered. You are supposed to inspire, inspire us and help us to realise our dreams. Nephilia stayed silent. You are a coward, Emma stormed off. Thank you, thank you so much. Um, Kiria Traber uh, is our fourth speaker uh, for this panel. So let's move uh, straight through. Hi, um, I'm really honored to be on this panel, um, all kinds of goosebumps. Um, and I'm excited to speak uh, with all of you about the longest love affair I've had in my life uh, <laughs> with um, the entertainer, from the Harlem Renaissance, Gladys Bentley. Um, and I have a slideshow for you, so I'm gonna get that started. So um, the title of this, If This Be Sin, will um, become clear later, but I might as well give it away now. It comes from Gladys Bentley's um, own uh, rumored autobiography that to my knowledge and all scholars' knowledge does not exist, unfortunately. Hopefully someday it'll emerge from the ether. That would be incredible. Um, and I said from riotous queer resistance in the 1930s to defensive conformity in the 1950s. So Dr. Rodriguez um, asked us to consider um, a really fascinating proposition um, as um, the invitation to the symposium. So I'll just read that one part that really stuck with me. In a moment when norm normativizing discourse, legislation, and media popularize particular images of LGBT identities, histories, and journeys, this symposium questions the future of queerness. In growingly assimilatory political paradigms, does a collective power remain for queer identities to subvert, challenge, or destabilize the hegemon? And I thought that was particularly resonant because um, when I discovered um, 
So first, let me say that um, a lot of the work that I'm going to be citing right now comes from um, a now deceased um, scholar and archivist, Eric Garber, who was the first uh, person to write about Bentley that I discovered in the San Francisco GLBT archives about a decade ago. And when I first discovered his work, there was virtually nothing else about her. And in the subsequent years that I started to find some texts um, that um, spoke about her, almost all of them were referencing Garber's research. Um, and that's important because now we're in a moment where last year, February of 2019, the New York Times pu published um, um, a late um, uh, um, uh, tribute to Gladys Bentley and other figures who had not been given um, a death notice in the New York Times as they should have given their the height of their um, significance in their time. So she has a feature in the New York Times. She has um, some of her images are in the New Smithsonian African American Museum. And there's a forthcoming PBS American Masters series called Unladylike 2020, which will have a full hour length episode just about Gladys Bentley. So she's gone from an incredibly obscure figure in queer and black history and entertainment history to becoming some someone that is sp spoken about and spread around. And while that, you know, and part of me is thrilled and excited, I'm also highly concerned about the flattening of this person's identity and the real, um, honestly, untidy, um, uh, as Alan said, ungovernable <laughs> um, nature of, of Bentley's true identity, um, it's going to be very hard to maintain that in the kind of sound bites and the kind of um, shaping that museums, p TV specials, and newspapers like to do with historic figures, especially as they're trying to fit a historic figure in a contemporary narrative of queerness. And so um, I am a playwright. I am, I, you know, my, my world, my playground is generally the stage and um, I, I dabble in and out of narrative as a former poet. Sometimes I love narrative, sometimes I hate it. So that's the realm that I'm typically exploring when, I, when I'm um, looking at Gladys Knightley's history, but I'm trying to merge a little bit of the academic thought and the narrative today. So you'll also hear some excerpts of my own writing some writing about Gladys that was from the time from other writers, such as Langston Hughes, um, and so on. Um, and so let's, let's go on a journey, if you will. Um, it's 1933. It's Harlem. It's the height of the Harlem Renaissance. And um, you might know it by other names, uh, the Black Belt, Nigger Heaven, um, the Negro Renaissance, as heralded by Elaine Locke, who's also now getting some um, celebration, latent. Um, black artists, intellectuals, and entertainers have the attention of the world. And all of us, us audience members, we all have a role as well as witnesses of this moment and participates, participants in this moment, which was rife with not only cultural explosion, but also cultural tourism, sexual tourism, race tourism, etc. So you might be uh, a white tourist, uh, a celebitant seeking thrills in Jungle Alley, or you might be a member of the Negro elite, a debonair dandy raised by middle-class black Victorians, tolerant of the lewdness of your brethren because here you're able to be as gay as you wanna be without turning heads. Or you might've come from more modest beginnings. You might be a child of sharecroppers who came up North seeking better work and you found much more than you bargained for. And we're all crammed together, elbow to elbow, liquor flowing, smoke billowing inside the clam house or perhaps the Ubangi Club, uh, where Gladys was known to perform. Uh, and we're waiting for the main act. Um, and here she comes, or is it he? And now, the performer you've all been waiting for, known by so many names. The Sophie Tucker of Darktown, the Brown Bomber of Sophisticated Songs, Barbara Bobby Mitten, Fatso Bentley, the legendary, the incomparable, the infamous Harlem's own Gladys Bentley. All right, all right. Did you miss me, ladies and gentlemen? A pair at each table, I see. Well balanced, nice, respectable. You are married, aren't you? Out past curfew with someone of the opposite sex, you best be husband and wife. Well, that's what my mother taught me. Even then, hands to yourself. I'm keeping my eye on you. Oh, well, I guess I should stop talking and play something. All right, all right, all right. <laughs> something respectable, something nice. That's what you come to see Gladys Bentley for, isn't it? Something you can tell your mother about on the way to church on Sunday. 
<laughs> All right, I think I have just the two. In my sweet little Alice blue gown, that bastard, he taught me to brown. I was bashful and shy when he opened his fly. When I saw what he had, Lord, I thought I would die. And he said, dearie, please turn around. And he shoved that big thing up my brown. He tore it, I bore it, Lord, how I adored it. In my sweet little Alice blue gown. Miss Bentley sat and played a big piano all night long, literally all night long without stopping, singing songs like the St. James Infirmary from 10 in the evening until dawn with scarcely a break between notes, sliding from one song into another with a powerful and continuous underbeat of jungle rhythm. Miss Bentley was an amazing exhibition of musical energy, a large, dark, masculine lady who, who whose feet pounded the floor while her fingers pounded the keyboard, a perfect piece of African sculpture animated by her own rhythm. And that quote was from Langston Hughes, um, who described her in The Big C as he was uh, waxing poetic about his Harlem that was no longer what it used to be. And so, uh, and those club ads you saw earlier were from various newspapers actually throughout her entire career, um, not just from the 1930s, which was really her heyday, but from the 1920s up through the 1940s and a little bit into the 50s as well, but I'll get more to that later. And, and there are many other descriptions of Bentley like this that, that, that Langston Hughes wrote, written by other luminaries of her time um, and some um, scholars um, and, and journalists as well. Um, and it's important to note that because what's clear is that in an era that might be considered um, a crucible for Black and queer culture, Bentley stood out. She was unique in her time even. Um, and I wanna just note for a second um, her signature style. She is often referred to as a blues musician, but that in and of itself is another flattening in the same way that um, Nina Simone would not describe herself as a jazz or blues musician. She described herself as an African-American classical musician, but she's flattened because that black bodies are flattened into what we can conceptualize them as in our limited imagination in, in Western American culture, uh, white American culture. And so, um, she, oh, here's some more images of, of Bentley being fabulous. Um, uh, but I wanted to point to the song that I just sang, which was a Bentley original, sort of. What she most often did is she would take popular songs of the day um, in the same way that you might hear like a Miley Cyrus or whoever is popular in the last five, 10 years on the radio, you would hear um, Broadway songs written by white artists, um, sung mostly by white, artists um, and often by uh, white sopranos who were just these pop stars. Um, and so the original is, in my sweet little Alice Blue Gown, when I first wandered down into town, I was so proud inside and I felt every eye and in every shop window I print passing by a new manner of fashion I found and the world seemed to smile all around. Till it wilted, I wore it. I always adore it, my sweet little Alice Blue Gown. So if you were an audience member in the time, you would know that song. And so to hear her turn it into a song about anal sex would have blown your hat off. <laughs> and she was also known to flirt and play with the audience members, many of whom, most of whom, were not just um, Harlem residents, but as again, were celebutant white tourists, folks who had major names in the day would come just to see Gladys Bentley play. And she would give them a show and come into the audience and mess with them. And they loved it. <laughs> um, and then I wanted to point again to her, her physical appearance and performance. So again, something that in the new explosion of references to her work, whether it be in, um, in the New York Times or, or, or otherwise, she's often noted as being trans male. And the, the fact of the matter is we don't know. The historical record is not clear and to project that label on her is in a sense flattening. I think it's interesting to note some things about her that we do know that are distinct. She wore masculine attire on stage and in life and she was not billed for the most part as a male impersonator as other butch or um, maybe now labeled as lesbian identified performers might have been. She was for the most part always Gladys. So Gladys masculine, she also had a public marriage to a woman, um, a white woman, um, like she made a big show of it, made it a show in and of itself. <laughs> um, seems that that was a part of her personality identity too, which was to be performative in all ways at all times. 
and it's slightly different from being a male impersonator as in I'm pretending to be a man, isn't it funny? And it's also perhaps slightly different than being trans male where there were people in that era who did pass as male um, and, and, and that was their true identity despite um, um, being born assigned female. And so it's unclear where she sat on that line. It's, 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 it's more important to say she played in the lines, <laughs> I think. Um, and then I just wanted to share a little bit. Um, what's really important also is that she was massively successful and famous. And I don't just mean in like, oh, what a fun, like um, off the beaten path. I mean, an apartment on the Upper West Side. I mean, two chauffeurs. I mean, wealthy. I mean, she wrapped people around her finger. And here's a little bit of her own words describing her journey to fame. At the age of 16, I left my home in Philadelphia and went to New York. A friend told me that the madhouse on 133rd Street needed a pianist right away. But they want a boy, my friend said. There's no better time for them to start using a girl, I replied. At the madhouse, the boss was reluctant to give me a chance. I finally convinced him. My hands fairly flew over the keys. When I finished my number, the burst of applause was terrific. My $35 salary went to $125 in a week, and the club was renamed Barbara's Exclusive Club after my stage name, Barbara Bobby Minton. From Harlem, I went to Park Avenue. There I appeared in tailor-made clothes, top hats and tails with a cane to match each costume. Stiff bosom shirt, wing collar, tie, and matching shoes. I had two black outfits, one maroon, a tan, a gray, and a white. Dandy, okay. <laughs> Very proud of her clothes. <laughs> um, so the Harlem Renaissance really remarkably persisted as long as it could um, through the Great Depression, but by the late 30s, it was really starting to dry up. That was sort of simultaneously like Gladys's peak, most famous, and then really the bottom fell out. Um, and she, like many performers of her time, had to figure out how to strategize how to continue their career um, in other ways. She ended up moving to Los Angeles, um, where she we, there's record that she lived with her mother. We don't know why exactly, and we don't know exactly what that was like, and I'll say more about that in a moment. Um, what's important is that so she continued to, um, to perform. She really tried to perform in one fashion or another every moment of her life. Um, and she, um, at some point, um, she started performing in uh, burgeoning gay clubs that started to emerge after World War II. And there was Mona's in San Francisco was it one where she had a lot of acclaim. And then there was a club in uh, East LA, Joaquin's, and there was this notice about the club. Um, uh, it shows liquor show uh, permit action held up um, for, um, uh, Gladys Bentley, a 250 pound colored female entertainer to wear trousers instead of skirts. This is really, really significant because it's indicative of the shifting times. Here we are noticing America instead of sort of allowing the back rooms to blossom into performance halls of queer delight. This is queer performance in life and on stage is being heavily regulated and legally policed. And she then is facing this along with anyone else who would have been a peer of hers. So you start to see this sort of collapsing in of her world be because of legal regulation. Um, and what's interesting is, and I think significant and has struck me ever since I discovered her, is that it's particularly oppressive to Gladys because she is so public, because part of her, her identity is to be an entertainer. Had she wanted to live more privately and more quietly as a butch or, or even a transmasculine person, she might have been able to get away with it in, you know, uh, the sort of continuously segregated Black enclaves. But to be out and on stage and to have interracial audiences meant that she had to contend with reality in a way that um, she might have been able to sneak around the corners with. Um, so I'm gonna skip ahead to the, the foretelling future of her life, which is quite fascinating, which is in 1952, she publishes this essay in Ebony Magazine called I Am A Woman Again. And it is quite a read <laughs> for so many reasons. And it's the thing that I first really became obsessed with, really fine tune, tooth combing through the text and the subtext. Um, and 
what's notable is that you can see, if you can see from these grainy pictures, and there's, there's better images of this at this point online, if you want to Google around, these are the ones that I happen to have access to from my like scanning of these documents back in 2010. <laughs> um, but um, uh, she's in feminine attire and is just sort of like, look at her now, like the makeover from the masculine to the feminine. And she's like a domestic goddess. There's like pictures of her like washing dishes and it's really surreal and strange. And she's basically plotting out this sort of like ex-gay narrative that follows a bit of a script. And so I hated my mother or my mother hated me from the moment I was born. She refused to touch me because I wasn't a boy. So I was confused. I ran away and I, and, and I found stardom, but inside I was, you know, facing this inner turmoil and shame. And so now I found this hormone therapy to correct my infantile sex disorder. And I married a man and I'm Christian and I'm going to be an ordained as a minister and everything's better now. <laughs> That's the text. The subtext though is incredibly fascinating and rich to me. And so I'll just speak to that really briefly. Um, I have violated the accepted code of morals that our world observes, but yet the world has tramped to the doors of the places where I have performed. These people acclaim me as a performer and yet bitterly condemn my personal way of living. My name has twinkled in the bright lights of storied streets of great cities. I've earned the distinction of being the first and in some cases the only performer of my race to crash the star-studded dressing rooms of the most plush glitter spots. I have earned the praise of the most cynical critics and I've had highly placed men and women respectfully thank me for the brief hour of joy my work has brought into their worried lives. But still, in my secret heart, I was weeping and wounded. When I read that, I hear her a condemnation of the outside world pressing down on her saying, you love me. You love me and what I give you. And it hurts because you love me on stage and you hate me off stage. And that's not the, the super text. That's the subtext. And I believe it's all through this article. And I know we're running on time. I'll make sure there's time for um, some questions, but I just want to uh, just breeze through these last few slides to give you a little tease. And you can Google some of this now, thanks to the internet. And 10 years later, it's, it's so thrilling and look out for the PBS documentary. Um, but uh, so here's some images of her transformation. Um, um, keep in mind, um, the House American on Activity, uh, House on American Activities Committee started in Hollywood, which is where she was living, which was predates McCarthyism. It's the Hollywood blacklist we've heard about. It's also the pink list. So she was dealing with that, a, a part of her periphery. Um, the narrative that she printed out is almost word for word from a novel called The Well of Loneliness that would have been like a hot novel when she was young. She pretty much stole the narrative. So there in, in and of itself, you're like, oh, this isn't really what happened to her. Um, uh, the science that she's quoting, of course, is debunked now as complete pseudoscience. There's no hormone therapy for the thing that she was talking about. And then lastly, some good gossip from the Chicago Defender, March 2nd, 1957. Um, on one occasion, um, I'm gonna skip through it, but basically someone went to her house, there was a picture of a man and a picture of a woman, and she said, oh, that's my husband and that's my wife. And that was after she'd written this Ebony Magazine <laughs> article. So who knows how she was really living. Um, and then she appears in 1958 on the Groucho Marx show, um, and she mentions if this be sin, her forthcoming autobiography. And March, Groucho Marx goes, oh, you're that Gladys Bentley which just goes to show for me the fact that all in all, I think this drive for her was still about trying to remain that Gladys Bentley, trying to be famous in whatever way she could. And I think the conformity was defensive and a way to protect herself. And I wonder what that lesson can teach us about facing this onslaught of conservatism um, and repression that we're having right now. Um, and then I can't leave without telling you that I'm writing a musical about her called If This Be Sin. Um, and um, I was gonna play a song, but we don't have time for it, but look me up on the web. Uh, email me and I'll tell you more about it and it's super black queer hot sexy musical text the end <laughs> goodness okay well I'll be the first to say uh, your talents all of you <laughs> just it makes me blush uh, um, this was absolutely fantastic. And, you know, so first I, I wanna thank um, Elise for setting the stage, uh, theoretically speaking, for us to be able 
uh, to kind of hold on um, to the central concept of echo, um, to question reverberation, dialectical uh, politics, the way that uh, opposition perhaps with identities, with labels, with uh, uh, political terrains, et cetera, um, has led to uh, so much generation uh, with what we identify with um, or how we experience queerness um, over these years. And, you know, your particular case um, is, is very interesting. And I will ask you a question from an audience member uh, regarding that. But I do want to point out that this echo is something um, or theoretical movement is something that we see within uh, uh, Athena, Alan, and Kyria's um, talks in very different ways. And for that reason, I just find, oh, I just appreciate. Um, and so, you know, I, I would want to point out uh, particularly the type of movement that we see with Alan expressing, uh, you know, with uh, migration and you know, this border, uh, this understanding of self that changes, but also is rooted in so many um, similar uh, uh, grounds of oppression, particularly colonialism, anti-Blackness, um, anti-Indigenous sentiment, et cetera, um, that we also see within Athena's story um, where movement is, is described as one from the sky um, uh, to the ground, right? But is very much in response to this um, breakage uh, between uh, what you're describing as inspiration or spiritual connection, et cetera, because of the politic of the day uh, on the ground and what we're seeing between the, the Nefluabata. Um, and so, uh, you know, of course, we see this within uh, Kyria's as well. And uh, I think, you know, in particular, um, some of this movement is, is within, uh, as you expose uh, Gladys's presentation of self and, and the way that her um, queer performance is, is <laughs> uh, bouncing back and forth and responding to place um, uh, and time in really crucial ways. And so uh, I thank you all for coming together with these very, very different um, offerings that all uh, I think really set the stage for this symposium. Um, I'm going to uh, combine uh, some of these questions for you. Um, so Sumaya says, um, for Elise, this was a truly, uh, this was truly a very interesting discussion. I really enjoyed listening to Echo and how the legend relates to Sharon Hayes' work. Uh, will you be examining or researching other legends and myths uh, relations to other um, artists. Also, uh, where would I go if I'd like to read more about this? Um, and I just want to add a second question for Elise, um, which was um, from David, who says, uh, I very much appreciated your image of an echo bouncing off of various surfaces, thus projecting over and over uh, the repetition of the original vocalization, all while transforming it. I was less sure of how you explain the symbolism of the fading away of the echo. So would you mind going over that? Um, while you sit with those questions, <laughs> I'll toss that. Um, there were also two questions for Alan. Um, from Samaya again, your poetry is beautiful and insightful. One of the ones that struck me the most was how you use the information form, uh, the immigration form. Um, and incorporate it into your poetry. Do you feel like your poetry always has a visual element like this, or do you also write poems that you feel stand alone with just your voice? Um, the second one for Alan is from Pepa, who asks, uh, well, who says, fugitive subject, ungovernable body, legal violence. These are really suggestive and powerful concepts, uh, and your poems bring them to life. Would Alan care to elaborate a bit on them? I think. It was in the context of legal violence that they mentioned how the law decides when to authorize us into existence. How does this fugitive subjectivity, especially in the case of, uh, or how does this affect fugitive subjectivity, especially in the case of the young 
um, such as your five-year-old self. Gracias. Um, lastly, for Kyria, um, not a question, but a word of thanks. I'll never forget your saying that to refer to Gladys as a trans male is to flatten her. The resistance to quote unquote normalizing or reverse normalizing perhaps is I find noble and true. So thank you. You all can sit with those questions. And if any pop up, um, I'll make sure to ask them as they come along. Uh, Elise, if you'd like to go first. Sure, thank you. Um, thank you for the thoughtful comments and questions. It's um, great uh, to provoke more thinking about this, but um, I guess I'll start with the first question in regards to the um, myth of echo and, and relating it to the uh, work of Sharon Hayes. Um, and and I, I, I'll say to your first question, I don't, I typically work um, this sort of overtly with uh, myths, with the sort of great uh, Greco-Roman uh, mythology. Um, I think there's a lot of other uh, more interesting um, sort of storytelling traditions that don't get the uh, scholarly attention that those myths get. Um, but I would, in this case, I was really interested in um, how, uh, through this reading it by Adriana Carrero, the sort of idea of loss with Echo um, as a subject is turned on its head into this idea that um, I think especially in marginalized communities, there is a formation, there is not necessarily a loss of subjectivity, but a building up of subjectivity through the sharing of experience and um, the searching for and finding of sort of resonances of yourself in uh, historical figures. Um, and so I don't have uh, any super good suggestions on that note in terms of more um, reading on uh, these sort of mythical figures, but I, I would really recommend Adriana Cabrera's text um, because I, I really only was able to scratch the surface of it. And it's a really wonderful um, take on vocality and, uh, and this figure of the echo. So um, I would recommend that for sure. Um, and to uh, David's question, um, Thank you for your thoughtful comment. I'm just rereading your question now. Um, the symbolism of the fading away of the echo. Um, so, you know, that's a, a sort of key part of, of the original myth that she becomes the echo through the loss of her corpore, through the loss of her body that she's reduced to um, just being able to repeat, uh, not even in her own voice, but it's sort of explicitly the sounds that she hears. Um, and, I think, you know, when we think about this in terms of what Hayes is doing, um, I'm interested in the way that moments in, in history and particularly um, these recorded moments around, uh, in the case of the works I cited in my presentation, um, Eleanor Roosevelt, for example, or Patty Hearst, um, that through their uh, cycling through history, through media, through discourse, uh, the narratives are so removed um, from the original sort of existence, the original bodies of the historical figures. And I think this is something um, that I would love to, you know, speak with Kyria more about in terms of Gladys Bentley, um, because I think this is another case that is very relevant. Um, but I think there's a tension between the um, loss of the texture and the details of these initial lives, um, but also the way that in the loosening that occurs with their um, spread, with their circulation, there becomes a room for the narratives to be of use to the formation of um, living people who uh, that narrative resonates with. And I think there's something really beautiful in that as um, the sort of converse of the loss of the loosening of the narrative, um, which can, um, I think, be a reduction of richness in this flattening that Curious spoke of, but also um, can provide um, lenses to understand ourselves and root ourselves in history that are really important to have. So I don't know if that answers your question, David, but that's where that took me. Uh, David said, thank you, Elise. That was a great reply. Um, Alon, if you'd like to go next. Great, thank you. I'm just reading it real quick. Okay, so visuality first. Um, so in 
Intergalactic Travels, which is the text that I primarily read from, um, my poetry does live on the, the visual realm. Um, I'm the only family, I'm the only person in my family who can read or write. Um, so for me, the text is never enough because the text creates um, a colonial distance between my family and I. My mother is a traditional weaver, as is my grandmother. Um, and if I'll just show you um, a spread of the book. So um, this poem is about uh, kind of like my mother's heart and it's in the shape of a heart. And this poem is inside an immigration form. Um, and my use of visuality is also a critique of poetry. Um, poetry sometimes is so invested in language that it um, forgets the genealogy of how language is introduced in the global south um, as an absolute, uh, particularly the written language, um, through cultural anthropology. Um, and as, as somebody who is Zapotec, um, you know, for us, um, language exists in the realm of uh, beating, in the realm of pattern making, uh, cooking, weaving. Um, so this is like uh, very much in line with Zapotec aesthetics. Uh, to love them more in the age displacement is uh, all in traditional form. Um, there's no visuals in it. Um, the, wor the work that I'm working on right now is called Chambale and it's a choreo poem. Um, it's a full length play written in verse and there's music, dance, stage directions, and it's in three languages. Um, and that's for me to kind of like explore on um, how else I can um, produce experience or um, an entry point into viewers, readers, and just my own community. Um, and then for the second question on the concepts of fugitive subject, ungovernable body, and legal violence, um, I Okay, so elaborate a bit on them. I think it was a context of legal violence uh, that they mentioned and how the law decides when to authorize into existence. Okay, so I think of the law as a literary genre that we never consider. Um, the law aestheticizes in the same way that uh, literature aestheticizes, right? Um, and I think that, I mean, is it Kyria or Kyria? It's Kyria. Kyria. And I think that your presentation also does a really good job at showing us how the law um, aestheticizes um, body size, it aestheticizes gender. Um, and for me, when I'm thinking about uh, legal violence, I'm thinking about the ways in which um, law as a literary practice creates a condition of possibilities for an imagined citizen. And that imagined citizen is always changing and shifting. Um, and in, in the first poem that I open, you know, like fugitivity, I take it from the Fugitive Slave Act of 1850. It's illegal for an enslaved person to run away from the plantation. So that marks a black illegality in the US South. Um, it's illegal for an American Indian student to run away from the boarding school. And that's an Indian fugitivity in the United States. And right now it is illegal for the colonized subject and for the diasporic subject to enter the US um, without documentation, right? But what does documentation mean when you are a descendant of people who arrive to the Americas as chattel? Um, and, and I think that that's where my genealogy of violence comes from. It's really rooted in constitutional law, federal immigration law, as it relates to blackness, indigeneity, and blackness and indigeneity are always already a queer assemblage because they're um, unrecognizable and also um, the law never knows what to do with it, what to do with those um, subject formations. And blackness and indigeneity are politically created identities. Like people are not black or indigenous. Like um, they're modern concepts in the same way that like queerness is a modern concept. There's so many ways in which queerness plays out in different cultures and communities. Thank you all. We are just a little bit over time and I think this is a really, uh, you know, great moment to wrap up. Um, and so I want to thank you all uh, for serving, you know, for offering through these panels. Um, I guess, or actually, uh, Alon, um, someone with the name R-L-L-B-Z-S, just wants to plug that your poetry is amazing, uh, <laughs> which I'm sure is a sentiment we all share. Um, oh, Benita. <laughs> um, 
So uh, I want to say that, that, you know, all four of you were absolutely stunning and that I'm so grateful uh, uh, for your presentations, for your deep reflections and for your offerings. There was a question earlier, um, uh, which is where to read more. Um, and so I do, uh, you know, I, I did answer on there for anybody who's watching that um, you can find on uh, hofstra.edu slash academics slash colleges slash H class slash LGBT. No, okay, so honestly, <laughs> you can go to the website um, that you found this registration from <laughs> and you'll be able to see that uh, there are hyperlinks um, for Athena's book and for Alan's uh, two books uh, where you can actually uh, purchase them directly. Um, for Elise and Kyria, if you too want to plug maybe uh, websites or anything like that, um, you can share them now and also share them uh, with me and then I'll actually just retroactively uh, hyperlink them. So I do say everyone um, who is interested, first of all, yes, buy all of the work. Queer work needs to be purchased. It needs to be put out there. It needs to be spoken about. Um, and these, uh, uh, you know, are particularly amazing uh, works. So thank you all so, so much. Um, and we're getting a lot of thank yous in the Q&A area as well. Um, yeah, so uh, hang tight, everyone. We will have um, panel number two. We'll start at 2.30. Um, what I will do is I'll end the recording right now, and then we'll start up again. Each of these sessions will be recorded, um, and uh, everyone who is a panelist now uh, will become an attendee. So uh, if you all want to uh, look up each um, of our uh, artists and scholars on the panel um, so that you can contact them, then I, I do really encourage that. Thank you all so much again. Thank you, that was great. Thank you. Yeah, thank you.